OMG, not the diddler going back to shaming and blaming Cassie in his latest appeal, y'all. Honestly, I could not believe what I was reading. But in Diddy's new version of the story, Cassie is a money-seeking, jealous, and unfaithful person who betrayed his generosity, running off and starting a family with the personal trainer he paid for, then demanding $30 million from Diddy to stay quiet. And I'm not kidding, y'all. This is literally what is in Diddy's new appeal to be granted bail. Like, Diddy's team has gone deep with language that resembled courtroom descriptions of the relationship between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, where Johnny Depp ultimately emerged victorious in civil litigation. Well, surprisingly, this new appeal actually has some people believing that Cassie may have lied and that it may actually be helpful in proving Diddy's innocence. So how about we just get right into it? Okay, now y'all know that before Diddy resorted to this attack the accuser strategy, he had already tried to appeal twice. In his first appeal, Diddy offered a bond of $50 million. And as per the letter, his mother, his sister, the mother of his oldest daughter, and his three adult sons all agreed to be co-signers, according to the proposal. The bail package said, Diddy's traveling would be limited to Florida and New York to attend court, meet with his counsel, and attend medical appointments. In addition, it noted that Diddy and his children already surrendered their passports to his counsel following the raids at his Miami and Los Angeles properties. Well, the first time he filed, the prosecutors were worried that Diddy would intimidate witnesses and obstruct the case if he were to be let out of jail. And they also suggested he was a flight risk given his wealth and access to private jets. Then following a back and forth between the defense and prosecutors, the judge denied Diddy's bail request. And this only meant that he would remain in custody and be sent to jail while he awaits trial. The second appeal Diddy filed also kind of outlined the same things, but, but that one was also denied by the judge, who said that the appeal was insufficient to ensure the safety of the community and the integrity of the case. Clearly, their approaches were not working, which is why they have resorted to a very harsh approach, filing a third appeal for pretrial release with the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Diddy's team is requesting his immediate release on appropriate bail conditions, citing alleged insufficient evidence for detention and alleged legal errors in the court's decision. First of all, Diddy is described in the appeal as a 54-year-old father of seven, a U.S. citizen, an extraordinarily successful artist, businessman, and philanthropist, and one of the most recognizable people on earth. The team also notes that Diddy traveled to New York to surrender because he knew he was going to be indicted, and that he took extraordinary steps to demonstrate that he intended to face and contest the charges, not flee. They even cited previous cases, saying that while judges gave a lengthy and detailed explanation for denying denying bail for people like Epstein, Maxwell, and Rainier, as required under federal law section 3142, no such explanation has been made for keeping Diddy confined pre-trial. In this new appeal, they also argued that they presented a robust bail package with extremely restrictive conditions that included home detention with GPS monitoring, no access to the internet or phones, 24-7 supervision, no female visitors except family and the mothers of his children, and weekly testing. They also said once again that Diddy complied with legal procedures thus far, pointing out that he surrendered his passport and offered to secure bail with his multi-million dollar residence and that he put his private airplane up for sale. Okay, here's where they mention Cassie. So the lawyers argued that the government's case is also overly reliant on a single widely publicized March 5th, 2016 video of Diddy and Cassie at a hotel. Remember in Cassie's lawsuit, she had said that around March 2016, Diddy became extremely intoxicated and after pouncing on her, he gave her a black eye. She also said that after Diddy fell asleep, she attempted to leave the hotel room, but he woke up and followed her into the hallway of the hotel while yelling at her. What Cassie also mentioned in her lawsuit is that Diddy grabbed at her and then took glass vases in the hallway and threw them at her, causing glass to crash around them as she ran to the elevator to escape. Then the lawsuit also said that Diddy paid the Intercontinental Century City $50,000 for the hallway security footage. But I don't think any of us was prepared for the video of that incident that went viral. The footage shows Cassie heading for the elevators with Diddy sprinting after her in a towel, pouncing at her. Then he proceeds to take her purse and suitcase from the floor near the elevators, and then he turns around and pounces on Cassie again as she lies there on the floor, unable to move. After about four seconds, he then briefly takes Cassie by her sweatshirt and drags her toward a room before walking away. Now, in the lawsuit, Cassie said that she took a cab to her apartment, but upon realizing that her running away would only cause Diddy to be even angrier with her and completely stuck in his vicious cycle, she returned to the hotel with the intention of apologizing for running away from Diddy. But when she returned, hotel security staff urged her to get back into the cab and go to her apartment, suggesting that they had seen the security footage showing Diddy and her in the hotel hallway. Well, according to Diddy's lawyers, Diddy and Cassie shared a long-term loving relationship that became strained by mutual infidelity and jealousy, and which was often mutually toxic. The attorney also argued that Cassie willingly participated in the freak-offs that she mentions in her lawsuit because that is how she and Diddy love to be intimate. They also argue that there were countless communications that negated any lack of consent or any coercion, and that 
that the overwhelming written communication always included mutual decisions to bring a third party into their intimacy. Diddy's lawyers even said they interviewed dozens of male escorts who participated in the freak offs, and they all said that they never witnessed anything non consensual. Now, ideally, federal law sets strict limits on what defense lawyers can tell a jury about an accuser's intimate preferences, but there's an exception to the rule, one big enough for Diddy to stake his defense on. What happens is that federal judges will allow evidence if offered by the defendant to prove consent. So Diddy's team is also banking on arguing this out to try and expose Cassie's intimacy preferences and in the process try to prove that she was actually into freak offs because she liked them. In addition, Diddy's lawyers also argued that at the time the 2016 video was taken, both Diddy and Cassie suffered from serious problems and even participated in rehab before finally separating in 2018. Then the appeal goes on to say that a lawyer representing Cassie demanded $30 million from Diddy in exchange for the rights of a tell-all book that Cassie had written. According to them, after Diddy refused to pay, Cassie filed a lawsuit, which was the beginning of whatever... With this new appeal, people are saying that the attack the accuser strategy is really a risky strategy in such a case, especially some of this one, where the key evidence is literally a video of Diddy behaving like an animal towards Cassie in a hotel hallway. Like, how is this even connected to Cassie's intimacy preferences, which the lawyers are highly banking on? Well, other than attacking the accuser, in another motion that the team also filed, Diddy's lawyers also said that there have been unlawful federal government leaks, including information relating to his grand jury and to the March search of his Miami and Los Angeles homes, and that, according to them, has prejudiced Diddy's case. They argued that the leaks have led to damaging, highly prejudicial pretrial publicity that can only taint the jury pool and deprive Diddy of his right to a fair trial. In fact, they are actually demanding that the judge hold an evidentiary hearing to examine government misconduct in connection with the leaks. In addition, Diddy's team is demanding that prosecutors and other members of the government be gagged to prevent leaking to the media, and that officials, in particular agents with the Department of Homeland Security be ordered to turn over emails, documents related to the alleged leaks. Homeland Security was particularly singled out in the defense motion, though prosecutors with the Department of Justice's U.S. Attorney's Office were also accused of failing to stop the leaks despite repeated behind-the-scenes complaints by the defense. The lawyers then say that regardless of what, if any, action the U.S. Attorney's Office took, the leaks continued, even after the arrest. They are arguing that only a leak could explain the presence of media at Diddy's Los Angeles home because the press showed up even before the crime scene tape was put up. They also said that more than 50 agents showed up as both the LA and Miami properties were simultaneously searched, and the agents deployed military-style armored vehicles with scores of heavily armed agents in full combat gear to seize some phones and computers. Cassie is once again brought up here, with Diddy's legal team saying that Homeland Security is by far the most likely source of the 2016 surveillance video. They even said that the tape was leaked on one of the few days that former President Trump's Manhattan hush money trial was not being held because the former president was given a day off to attend his son's high school graduation. Apparently, federal agents would have known that May 17th was thus a perfect time as it was a slow news day given the break in the Trump trial. They are also saying that even on September 18th, three days after Diddy's arrest, a source described as a Department of Homeland Security agent who participated in the Miami raid told the New York Post that the music mogul had rooms that were clearly dedicated to intercourse with cameras all around. But regardless of what Diddy's team has presented, prosecutors have also sought to show how Diddy used the vast resources of his business empire to facilitate his crimes, including by arranging flights for male escorts and having 1,000 bottles of baby oil and lubricant on hand. Prosecutors say Diddy also relied on employees to cover up his misdeeds, suggesting they pressured hotel security to delete records of him attacking Cassie. They said that data from more than 40 of Diddy's devices and accounts is still being extracted, including from his laptops, tablets, hard drives, cloud accounts, etc. And that additional evidence came from the electronics of third parties or consists of business records from financial institutions, phone companies, hotels, airlines, and other businesses. They are saying that even if Diddy produces evidence that shows that Cassie or any of these accusers said yes, that would not negate the government's case here because that's the very nature of the crime, that any consent was coerced. I mean, things are clearly beginning to heat up. And like I said, apparently this new appeal and the new motion has swayed some people into believing that Diddy may not actually be the monster he is being painted as. But what do you guys think? Have there been unlawful federal government leaks that have led to damaging, highly prejudicial pre-trial publicity that can only taint the jury pool and deprive Diddy of his right to a fair trial? Does Diddy's new appeal attacking Cassie help his situation or only make it worse? Let me know what you think in the comments section below.